welcome to the Agros Church Podcast. I'm Associate Pastor Taylor DeSoto. I'm Lead Pastor Dane Johansson. And I am a deacon at Agros Church. What's your name? My name's Eric. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we're going to start our podcast off with the usual introduction by talking about what we're reading. So Dane, what are you reading today? Uh, I'm basically working on the same books I talked about last time, uh, plus a lot of First John commentaries, but I did want to mention uh, a couple of books. I recently acquired this. Uh, in a used bookstore in Mesa, Arizona, and it is it was printed in 1822. It's a Greek New Testament. Uh, according to the the exemplar that they used was Robert Stephanus's uh, corrected edition. So I'm assuming that's a uh, 1551 royal edition, the one with the verse numbers. But anyway, it's a it's a reprint of that um, in a type sign that was new to 1822. Um, <clears throat> but it's it's really good for the purposes of that we've been using, you know, text criticism and everything. We've been talking about text criticism, the confessional text position, TRs, things like that. So this is one of the TRs that were used uh, in the making of the King James Bible and and the other editions that came after um, of the Greek text. So the Elsevier brothers used this, mm. etc. Um, so it, it's it's really cool, but it um, it does have a couple of readings that. Uh, are different, and so that's primarily why I got it. Plus, it's just awesome. Um, it's, it's old, a, yeah, it's super old. It's a uh, it's a good condition though for how old it is. Yeah, but I got this uh, at a used bookstore, and then I wanted to recommend to you guys. Uh, oh, yeah, these are real books back here. They're not just <laughs> yeah. We, it's, Sometimes it's I read green them. screen. Yeah, um, Reverend G. H. Kirsten's Reformed Dogmatics. It's a two volume work uh, translated actually by Joel Beakey. Um, and I think his doctoral <clears throat> receiver, maybe. Uh, anyway, it says in the intro, but he was a Dutch Reformed theologian who died in the 1900s. Um, mm -hmm. This is just a really brief, really concise, awesome uh, summary of Reformed doctrine from a Dutch Reformed perspective. Um, it's real short. I think it's a total, it's 585 pages, and... Uh, Really easy to read, really concise. Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed it when I got it, and I made you buy it too. It's actually yeah. really cheap too. I think it's like twenty bucks. Twenty dollars. I've referenced it a lot. It's 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 good stuff. Yeah, it's put out yeah. by. It's it sells on ReformationHeritageBooks dot com. Right. For like twenty. It's bucks. always on sale too. Like I think the sale price is like thirty two dollars, but it's always there for twenty. So yeah, it's put out by the Netherlands Reform Book and Publishing Committee. If you want to look for it there, but it's on ReformationHeritageBooks dot com. Right. Dot org. Where it is. What about you, Taylor? What are you reading? <clears throat> so this week I read... So this book came out, I think, two days ago. <laughs> uh, and I consumed it. It was actually... I did a book review on it. It's on the Agris blog. If you guys are interested, then we'd probably put it in the YouTube video comments or the link description. Um, but it was it was a fascinating read. I, I, I ate this thing up. Well, what is it? Oh, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> a Reforming Apologetics by... JV J. Fasco, and it's uh, it's more or less it does a couple of things. So it, it first uh, defends the idea that that natural theology should be used in apologetics, uh, which it makes it largely polemic against the presuppositional purist uh, sort of camp. Um, he also interacts a lot with historical theology and the, and the reformed heritage of <clears throat> of the. Uh, natural theology that was found all throughout the medieval scholastic period and all the way back. So I, I found it really informative. It was really scholarly. Uh, I was overall impressed. There's a couple of places where I think that maybe um, he kind of strays off the path a little bit, uh, but that's in my review. Um, so I can recommend it. It's good stuff. Very. It's uh, recommended by Richard Moeller and uh, James Dalzal. Um, solid. So it can't be that bad. Well, and, and even if you're just even if you're a precept guy, it should right. be it, it should be reading that you do to right. I mean, this is the most recent uh, critique of the presuppositional position and defense of the other. So it's probably something that I think all right. preceptors should read. Yeah, I, guess, I guess on that note, like maybe I'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, I think that that kind of a, a secondary application that he makes in this book is that a lot of people in modern Christianity really are uninformed as to their, their theological roots. Mm. And a lot of people, I mean, especially Calvinists, uh, people that are presuppositional apologists, people that are reformed in general, uh, don't really read a lot. And he critiques Van Til 
um, kind of levying the accusation that Van Til interacted with Aquinas through secondary sources. And whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, but that's a problem today, right? Regardless of, of his critique of Van Til being accurate or not, uh, Christians all the time, they just trust their favorite scholar um, or they take at face value things that they read in popular level books. That is true. Yeah, right. And and that's a problem. That's a huge problem. I mean, in, in every single area um, you go online, uh, I like to say you don't have to travel very far on Facebook to find ideologues and people that haven't read or they read one book and they think that that's like the whole theological position, like no one can be different than this. And um, so, so that, as a tertiary application, I took that away from the book. I thought that was really valuable. Um, but but Dane's right. It is a, it is a critique of presup. And I think if you're a presuppositionalist, it would be valuable for you to read mm. and to read without like, you know, an intent, you know, just a crazy bias. Uh, as someone who kind of leans that direction, I, I, I we're, we've been talking about this a lot lately. We're kind of disenchanted with the whole idea of apologetics as like a theological topic. Um, it, it's, it's a method, just like preaching, just like evangelism. Mm. Um, you don't find in dogmatics those topics. Mm. Uh, they're, they're applications of theology. Um, so I, I would even dare go as far to say as apologetics isn't even a proper topic of theology. Yeah. And I might get in trouble for saying that, but hey. Um, Next thing I haven't gotten into, I'm going to read it this week. Jeff, Pastor Jeff Riddle sent us a copy of this pamphlet that he compiled and edited, and it's on Benjamin Keach. It's from the Keach Conference. Yeah, it's from the Keach the Conference. Papers that were given there. So it's got some some information on um, some of the uh, confessional stuff, stuff, um, some, <laughs> some of his contributions to the confession. So um, I'm excited to get into that. And then I received this week the works of John Flavel, uh, which this is volume two. I've been perusing it this week. I'm using a, that for my study throughout um, probably the next month. And then somebody recommended that we do a review of the uh, of um, Garnett, Garnett Howard Milne's Has the Bible Been Kept Pure, the Westminster Confession of Faith, and so on. Uh, we're going to do that at some point in the next month, probably. Hopefully. Right. right. If we can get through it. If we can get through it. Uh, well, just... we, we can do like a special episode where we just talk about it instead right. of like a, a whole thing. So we're going to get to that. And then finally, I also got uh, Herman Vitius, The Economy of the Covenants. And this is two volumes, but I brought one for the sake of the backspace. The other two are right there. Yeah. So Dan's got them up there. And I'm really, really excited to get into this. Uh, specifically, we're going over the Ordo Salutis uh, in Sunday school this weekend, and so I've been kind of tapping into Vitius a bit mm. on that. Um, so, that, yeah, that's what I'm reading uh, this week. I know it's a lot. We kind of rambled there. Sure. Um, Eric, what are you reading? Uh, way less than that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm reading uh, Puritan Hope by nice. Ian H. Murray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'm still working through Holiness. That's kind of been the book that I, I read at night when I'm slowing down and I usually fall asleep uh, while I'm reading it. Some nights I, f I, I get more awake reading it because it gets me so amped. But <laughs> of Holiness? Yeah. yeah. Of Holiness. Yeah, it's it's one of the best books I've ever read. Give me um, nightmares. On the topic of Holiness. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's a super encouraging yeah. book. I mean like the, the whole book is basically about like the reality of what mm. it means to pursue holiness and the reality of what holiness actually is. Mm. Yeah. You know, um, it's been a good companion to uh, Mortification of Sin. Mm. Yeah, because you know I mean? of mortification of sin is like a really kind of scary book. You know, what I mean, there's a lot of encouraging stuff in there too. But holiness kind of digs in. You know, you get into the trenches with the book with with holiness of the actual just practical how you know how to be holy, how to live mm. a holy life, yeah. and um, how not to be run down and super discouraged by you know your lack of it. So mm. right. That book is is a really really encouraging one. Like I said, it's one I'm reading really slowly. I'm highlighting and underlining and writing mm -hmm. things and interacting with it a lot. Nice. Um, and then uh, a Puritan Hope is kind of the book that I'm I'm like focusing on a lot. So I read that a lot in my spare time. But mm -hmm. those those two primarily. There's other things I'm reading too. But uh, th those are the. What are your What are your takeaways from Puritan Hope so far? Um, the optimism mm -hmm. aspect, because my my thing is like I, I've never, I've always really really liked the idea of post millennialism. Hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to say that I'm, mm -hmm. you know, not a post millennialist, and I'm not going to say that I'm not an amillennialist. I'm really kind of uncertain still. I'm, I'm still working my way, you know, towards that. But the main thrust of the Puritan hope is not, um, from what I've read so far, is not diehard post millennialism. But it's basically just that there's a, there's this optimism of mm -hmm. of the fact that Christ is ruling and reigning right now, and mm -hmm. that 
where we as Christians go, we bring the kingdom of God mm. and that the, the gospel will prevail against the gates of hell. Like, you know, the Bible says the gates of hell will not prevail against Christ and his church. And mm. what that, you know, what I've, what I've heard that explained as is that we are actually on the offensive mm. and that the gates of hell will not prevail in their defense mm. against yeah. the advancement of God's gospel. Yep. So, yep. so the Puritan hope is basically that that is a sure and certain victory. Um, and that, you know, you and I and all Christians can go out into our lives. We can go into the marketplace, into the battlefield, um, and we can, we can, you know, we can basically strut out, you know, in, in, in victory, knowing mm-hmm. that Christ has conquered and he is on the throne and he is coming to redeem all things and, and you know, draw us to him and, you know, judge mm. the wicked and find Amen. a good way with sin and evil. So yeah, that's great. It's, it's kind of helping me understand and articulate my optimism that as an amillennialist I always held to and just didn't really understand fully why so right. it's kind of I'm, I'm in the process right now but it's 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 becoming more clear and um you know as I'm as I'm reading so yeah, great it's a great book awesome so today we're going to have a plain discussion on the confessional text position and its advocates we're taking a short little break from our series uh mm-hmm. Dane and I thought that it would be a good idea to uh mm-hmm. since there's there is a, a lot of buzz i guess around that the three episodes ago and and just kind of circle back on that and have a real conversation about you know why we hold the confessional mm. text as a, as a group here uh, um so yeah, not so much even <clears throat> engaging the evidence because that's already been right. done yeah uh, and it can be done again obviously but uh, more just on a practical right uh, like where do, you, where do you go to next like, right you know, what's your next step right and like how do you live this out now that you have it <clears throat> right and that's kind of why we asked uh, eric to come alongside as well today uh, joining us because he's he's been on this journey with us as well um mm. and and at our church i think we mentioned it in a either last episode or the episode before at our church, we don't force anyone to hold to the confessional text right, position yeah. because when we planned the church, we were not a confessional text position church. No. Um, we preached from the ESV. That was mm. our like, you know, preferred Bible. We encouraged all of our congregants to get an ESV. So that way we'd all be reading from the same translation. Yep. Um, so, but we've made, you know, we've taught Sunday schools on it, primarily Taylor, but I was able to join in a few times on Sunday school and, and uh, give, give messages and teachings on, uh, the evidence for confessional text position, why to hold to it, etc. But we haven't forced it on anyone. Yeah. Uh, like if you if you have your ESV Bible, you don't even walk through those doors, man. Um, so that kind <laughs> of we, thing. Yeah, so. we have a couple of people. We, it doesn't even get mentioned, honestly. So yeah. maybe we start with a newcomer. Uh, so Eric, what what view did you hold prior to being a confessional text advocate? I mean, I just held to the, you know. I didn't even really understand the critical text versus the confessional text at all. I just, I just thought that the ESV was the most accurate because it used the oldest and best manuscripts, which was like mm. something I'd always heard. Um, but after, you know, coming along this, this journey that, you know, I've, I've come mm. down, um, the way I can look back at it and articulate it now is that I held sort of like an irrational, um, like leap of faith kind mm. of view. Mm. Um, where on one hand, I believed God absolutely preserved his word. But then on the other hand, I believe that we needed to employ the, you know, certain methods Mm -hmm. to determine what that preservation was. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you have to kind of like filter out and, you know, figure out for yourself exactly, you know, does, you know, does the longer ending of Mark belong in the text? You know, Mm -hmm. does the pericope adultery belong in the text? Uh, things like that. And, um, growing up always believing that those were scripture it's like Hmm. okay you know have i been lied to this whole time or Hmm. just have i been deceived this whole time and if not you know how does that you know that doesn't line up apparently apparently that doesn't line up with the evidence so it's like i remember when i started taking greek at like seminaries and stuff like years ago and mm -hmm. started like exploring text criticism more it's probably like six years ago if not more um we were talking about I listened to John Piper's sermon on when he was preaching through yeah. John, and it was. I listened to that the, same that yeah. same sermon, yeah. Well, Jeff Riddle did a, a review of it, yeah, yeah. Um, and I remember talking to you about it, and being like, "Oh yeah," like after I listened to it and and everything, I was like, "Yeah, I mean, that's." I was like, "Do you think that the Pericope Adultere is scripture?" And you said, "Yeah," and I said, "No, it's not." And I gave yeah. you all the reasons that Metzger lists because that's all Piper does is right. it's like a list of six right. things. I yeah, think. reasons yeah. why the internal reasons, the external reasons, etc. And then even then you were like, I, I don't know. That's just like, I, I, you're like, I don't 
like that. Yeah, you don't like it. <laughs> and I like mean, force it on you. I was right. like, no, it's the this is what it is. Right, and it's like it's, yeah. it's got to be this way. And like in, in my you know mind at the time, I'm just like, yeah, okay, I guess you know, like yeah. eventually you just kind of roll over and it's just like, well, I guess God still preserved His word. Then it's like, well, but He didn't, you know, in that way. Well, it's like, well. But he did. Right. <laughs> he had to have, you know, but, but yeah, so it's well, like, have it. it's, it's like, a kind of this irrational, yeah. you know, holding two opposing realities. And... It's like a dialectic. Yeah. Yeah. So, so speaking of, of dialectic, Dane, what, what, did, what view did you hold? <laughs> well, okay. So <laughs> uh, I started learning Greek in 2009, but like actually started taking Greek and taking it seriously. I learned a great deal of it on my own prior and after taking courses on it, but holding Greek or taking Greek and, and starting to really learn it in about 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, from there on, I was exposed to the, you know, debates that were going on. Also, I, you know, read a lot of the Puritans. That's when I ex- explored the Puritans and found the Puritans and found Spurgeon and everybody. And they all not only use the King James, but, but, you know, employ mm-hmm. similar language as the King James Bible. Um, yep. and I also found, you know, you know, apologists that I liked at the time, like, uh, got really into like James White and, and, uh, all sorts of other things. And, and that was just the commonly held view, whether you're reading pretty much anyone modern, yep. uh, that I was exploring, they all held to that, whether it was uh, DA Carson's, uh, works on, on John and his, uh, uh, writings on scripture and stuff that was that was the view that you held rc sproul held that view macarthur yep. holds that view Every, everybody i was exposed to held that view <clears throat> but at the same time being in the reform circles uh at least you know intellectually and online and, and reading i was exposed to this other view as well and 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 king james Olyism. so i was, I was just kind of just a confusing mush of uh, the guys who were King James only is I obviously thought were complete wackos. Cause a lot of them are like you have, um, Gail Ripplinger. She's crazy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sam Gipp. He's crazy. Uh, like, you know, go down the list. There's like these, these nutsos over here. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I totally give it. They're crazy. We're not King James only and the arguments they employ are total, uh, lunacy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had this basically like how I could define as a shaky reason eclecticism, where the more I studied, the more, you know, works I got, like Dabney's works, like he has a work in there on the TR and he has a work on uh, the revised, uh, the revised version that came out in the mm-hmm. 1800s. <laughs> Dabney has really good work, work on the uh, first John five, seven, actually. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's just so much I was exposed to and I, I wanted to lean that way. And I just couldn't. I had this like shaky reason eclecticism where I think if I could put it in words, it would probably be basically your rational leap of mm-hmm. faith where it was just, well, you know, this is what the guys that I look up to say. Right. And, and basically whenever I would like get to a point where I was like on the edge, I would be like, well, I trust the, the scholarship behind the ESV. That's just what came down to. Yeah. I just appeal authority. I, I trust the ESV and the scholarship behind it. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Well, like when, when I was trying to pick a translation, <laughs> I remember everyone saying there's like some 70 something scholars on the ESV, you know, mm-hmm. translation team, or I don't even know if that's accurate, but that's mm-hmm. what I heard. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that would, I mean, that, that's kind of the line you get. It's the most academic translation and, mm-hmm. you know, all this. Well, yeah, they did a great job. They still yeah. do a great job of, uh, um, advertising, you know? Yeah. 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 It, I mean, if you, the, have the, you seen the, the box? has like some killer marketing behind it. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. seriously does. Yeah. I remember, remember those videos? It was like black screen behind oh, him yeah. and like the lighting was all cool. And it was like John Piper leaning forward like he does. And it's oh, like, great. I look, the ESV is a dream come true yeah. to me. And like, there's like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. like, there's just so much hands going on. Piper hands. Yeah. I mean, Piper's great. We're not dissing Piper, but, no, love um, we love Piper. Yeah. Mm. It, it's just that, and if you've ever seen their boxes, that their premium Bibles come in. Oh, oh, come nice. on. Skyler, just, Skyler just totally ripped them off. Yeah. And, and they, I mean, with good reason, like, yeah, it's just a plain yeah. box with like a silver logo on it. That's you're like, it. it couldn't be any cleaner. Matt simpler. Black. Oh yeah. Murdered yeah. out Bible box. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> anyway, Man, it's just like, you know, you appeal, you appeal to the, the authorities above you yeah. and, and that kind of, uh, you're kind of in another <clears throat> realm. What, what was your, what was your view prior? I, I was just kind of a consumer, you know, I, 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 <laughs> marketing. I, 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 the marketing. Guy, I, yeah, I, I didn't really consider textual issues to be an important thing. Uh, I mean, most of the first, I would say maybe six to seven years of my Christian walk was like, all apologetics. I mean, that was like kind of my deal. Seven years. Yeah. Wow. Like, I, yeah. Like I, <laughs> I mean, I really pretty much had only read, like I only read maybe Wayne Grudem and Matthew Henry and apologetics materials. Yeah. 
Uh, and, and so, you know, being in that kind of camp where you're engaging <clears throat> the different apologetics material, I think I read, uh, William Lane Craig too. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I let you borrow it. That was a bad choice. I didn't become a Molinist though. So there, <laughs> like a hell. I remember, I remember when you gave me, cause I gave you da- Dabney's practical philosophy, the one right there. And then, uh, where, where is the other one? Oh, it's over there. Uh, but I gave you those two books, and then when you returned them like months later, because you were doing like debates at like ASU and stuff. Yeah, I was. I was uh, that was when you were debating. taking like yeah. Bart Ehrman classes yeah. and everything. Uh, not Ironically. with Bart Ehrman, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is like kind of crazy that I wasn't confronted with textual issues because I was like yeah, yeah. I, I was reading Bart Ehrman and Elaine Pagels, and mm-hmm. yet it still didn't cross my mind that like. I should consider, you know, what? I, it was almost fideism. It was just kind of like, like, yeah, like I'm going to believe this even if I'm wrong. Yeah, you know? fideism, that's, a good, that's a good word for it. I guess yeah. that's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be like all philosophical about it, but fideism is like the right word where you just sort of just take it on, you know, blind faith. Right. Like that, that's what, like, I remember going into my lost Christianity's lost gospels classes, which we've talked about on the podcast before. And I kind of had to like gear myself up. I'm like, no matter what I hear, I'm a Christian. And then I'd walk yeah, in the door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, maybe it was my early exposure to Bart Ehrman that made me just kind of, you know, turn the blinders on to it. Um, Cause I'm like, okay, these textual criticism guys, they're all heretics, you know, they're all bad. And so maybe I just put my head in the sand, but what, what was when, when, uh, when, no, you cause were... I, yeah. Cause I think, cause I know what we're about to say, yeah. and I think we could just transition to the next part with starting with you. Cause <laughs> how did you reconcile your views once you became, uh, you know, once, especially once you came here and planned the church and everything with me, um, h- how did you reconcile your uh, high view of scripture and that I'm a Christian no matter what the Bible's true, no matter what, <laughs> kind of fideistic consumerism yeah. uh, and, you know, the fact that there are textual variants and everything. Well, what was the, fr- the first time you brought up this conversation to me? We were sitting like, at IHOP. We were sitting at IHOP. What did I say? I, I, well, I, I brought my, uh, my Diglot, my ESV NA28 Diglot, and I was just like talking to you about, because I've been, I was obsessed with this stuff for yeah, so yeah. long. You're and and no, freaking nuts. Yeah, I apparently am too. No, no one wanted to talk about it with no. me. I was really concerned and everyone's just like, whatever, just use your ESV. Yeah. And I was like, fine. <clears throat> just consume like, it. Yeah, yeah, just consume it. I have like $1,200 yeah, in ESV. say that five seconds later, you'd be like, well, but, but which one? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which ESV? I mean, it's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> no one cared. Uh, but yeah, I, I started talking to you. You said, you said, honestly, I don't care and I don't want to talk about this while I'm eating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I said something that you said, but yeah, what it was if... about it was about like four months later. I Man, almost what, switched. What about John three sixteen? You you did something. I think you had said, "What if they found a manuscript that didn't have John three sixteen? Because I was talking about like the methodology. Like if we're going to be consistent, if we're going to use the old, old, oldest and best, I'm like, if we're going to throw out this, why not just throw out that? I was like, what if they found a hundred pristine manuscripts from the you know you know 150 AD in Alexandria, and none of them, they were all of the Gospel of John. None of them had John three sixteen. Just didn't have it. And you're like, then check it out. I literally <laughs> said, throw it out then. And I was um, like, well, that's consistent. I'm not going to talk well, about this anymore. And, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that was the thing. At least I was consistent. Like, yeah, because, you know, being but would in, you really have? <clears throat> yeah, I, right. I would have 100 percent thrown it out. It was because, back when I had a desk right there. You were sitting there reading, I think, First Kings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like, chuck it, dude. <laughs> that's right. I was, that was when um, I went through my Bible last year in like a couple months uh, because I had a lot of time. And, um, and Dane, I was sitting there and I was just bothered by Dane in, interrupting me reading my Bible. Uh, and and I, said, I said, I said, I don't care. Throw it out. Um, <laughs> which is not a good thing to be laughing no, about, but no. it's like, it's, it's comical because, because like it's that's, absurd. yeah, it's absurd. It's absolutely <laughs> absurd, but that's the logical end of the critical text position. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you're interacting with, you know, the, the dividing line and that's all you hear. Mm. Right. The er, we're throwing out the the percope adultere and, and we're throwing out the cameo hineum and we're throwing out all these 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 scriptures, like, you know, Romans 16, 24, John 5, 4. We're throwing all of these out based on the earliest and best manuscripts. So, like, if if we're doing that and the earliest and best manuscripts don't have this verse, throw it out. Who who cares what the church has received throughout the ages? I don't care. Mm. I, I want I want a scientific Bible. Um, and, and that was. And, and I really didn't think too hard about it. So mm-hmm. I guess like when I moved over to the confessional text position, Dane calls me up out of the blue, by the way. I, I, I'm glad you did it. But in that moment, I was ruined for about 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, it was just uh, a couple months ago. Yeah. yeah it was, no, 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 it was uh, when, no, when I, we switched to confession. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that, yeah, it was just a couple months ago. Man, we're pretty new at this. It's like four months ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it was like four months ago and I'm, I'm, I was at my desk reading something. I, I forget what I was reading. 
And Dane calls me up and was like, hey, do you have like a second to talk? And I thought that maybe like his dog died or like, you know, something like that happened. <laughs> I would just um, text you if that <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I figured something off. serious. And he, so he, he opens up. Um, I think you were talking about the longer ending of Mark. Yeah. And I think from the time that this, this – keep in mind, this is Taylor who would say that throw John 360 now. And this is where I'm at, right? Within 30 minutes, I'm sitting on the floor against my closet – like like rubbing my head <laughs> and, and basically saying like uh yeah let's i think and then i bought a kjv like that night like and kjv and then you were like i should yeah. just get a kjv well, but, but i i think that that because i was so immersed in worldview and i was teaching a, a series yeah, that's on, what it was yeah. on kruger um on the theological method for de- determining canon it wasn't a big leap for me like, I, you know, I was going through my confession every month and I, I was I was going through Kruger on the theological method for determining canon. Mm-hmm. And, and I was immersed in like apologies, like worldview stuff and, and Bonson and all these guys, you know, presuppositionalism. And, and you know, and, and so when Dane presented the argument to me, I was like, yeah, that's it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 it seriously like all the synapses fired. And I was like, this is the view like this is it. And and it wasn't hard for me. Like it, it just fell right into place. And then, and then I guess when I officially clicked for me, I've talked about on the podcast when I figured out what the diamonds meant in my NA twenty eight. Yeah. Um, the indeterminate readings, like when they couldn't figure out the directionality, like then I was just like, which yeah. is the first time they've ever done that in a Nestle Allen. Right, right. So two thousand. I mean, and that's been around since two thousand twelve. But like I said, I didn't care back then. So. Right. Um, so that was the exact one I brought to IHOP, and you said I don't care. I'm eating. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, Dane. So what? What was? How did you reconcile? Oh uh, wow. Um. Again, it was I, I was a shaky reason eclecticism. Yeah. It was more just insanity. Um, I, I was struggling a lot. Like you know, you you were hanging out with us right before you moved to Cali or uh, not Cali, Philly, mm-hmm. um, and that was really when I was like freaking out about yeah. it. And yeah. so you know where I went logically, it makes sense. Yeah, I went to Carl Bart. Yeah, yeah, that, that, was, that, a, that, that was a fun couple months. It was like a year. That was like two years. Yeah, that was, it was like about a year and a half. I didn't there talk was, to there him. was a there was a couple month like peak though. Yeah, where yeah. I didn't talk. We, about we walked that, the one day we walked like two miles and just talked about Bart the entire way. And like by the time we got back, I basically didn't even believe in the Bible anymore. I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> God spoke yeah. once. <clears throat> right. I think that was probably why by the time you sat me down at IHOP, I was just kind of like whole, like over the whole conversation <clears throat> because yeah, like, that's yeah. that's how I got too. I kind of really got just kind of over it. So I was just like, I want my Bible. Leave me alone. Like right, right. Yeah. Which I think, like, you know, it's – and we'll address that later. We To hold to the TR is not to do that. Right, exactly. Um, right. Like, like there, there are – sure I'm sure there's people that do that in, you know, what, whether they're holding to anything. But, uh, you know, the, the argument that's always used to, you know, people always say this. Well, I want what Paul wrote. I want what John wrote. I want mm-hmm. what uh, the, the Apostle Peter wrote. Yeah, so do we. Like, who, yeah. no, no one's contesting that. I, I want what was originally penned. I don't want what scribes add later. I, right. I agree. Yeah. Um, that that's the whole point of preservation is that the words were preserved. We didn't lose right. any of them, and we didn't get any more from it. Someone else, yeah. right? But how I, you know, tried to reconcile my high view of scripture, like the Chicago <coughs> statement of biblical inerrancy, mm-hmm. was like basically where I would agree with. Yeah. So the the autographs were mm-hmm. inspired and inerrant. They're gone. Everyone acknowledges they're gone. They've been gone mm-hmm. since probably the first, second, third century. Yep. You know, we don't have. I think. I think it might have been, I don't know the church father's name, but the last time the, the autographs were even mentioned was very early on. Yeah. And so we don't have them. And the uh, apographa that we have, uh, so so the apographs that came, the, the copies that came down, we all know are full of mm. uh, discrepancies, some major mm. and some minor, yeah. uh, most minor. Um, and, and certain streams or families have more than others um, and are different than others. So when, when I'm looking at this and looking at the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy, they're not saying anything. B.B. Warfield and, and all those guys who, who gave us the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, we, I praise God for men like MacArthur and R.C. Sproul and everybody that stood up before, you know, before I was ever even a twinkle in my grandfather's eye mm-hmm. um, and, and stood up for the tenacity, veracity and inerrancy and inspiration of the text that, you know, I praise the Lord for that. Right. However, 
they were reacting to a much different thing, and I think they had faulty tools and faulty methods. Right. Um, well, and BB, so, BB Warfield never never imagined that we'd still be doing text criticism. On right. Yeah. He thought we'd be done by now. That's a good point. Right. And so <clears> you know, right. looking at the Chicago State with biblical inerrancy, it's not actually saying anything. So where I went was Bart. I found a much more powerful view of Scripture in Karl Bart, where I saw that the Bible can become God's word and does when God uses it. And that the, the, uh, the recording of the scripture hmm. is the record of revelation. It's the artifact of revelation that, right. uh, God left behind. It's the crater from the explosion that was the event of that hmm. moment of inspiration. And so therefore it can't be a narrant except for when God speaks through it again. That was much more hmm. powerful than we ha- we had the, the, right. the original aut- autographs are inerrant and we don't have them and never will. That, that, that was much more powerful to me. Yeah. And so going from that, um, I got stuck in that. And so I rejected inerrancy for the wrong reasons. And I rejected inerrancy for the good reason uh, because the reformers never used that term. They used infallibility. Mm-hmm. The same for the confession. But um, with Bart, I found that and, and I thought that was it was either that view, the Chicago view, which was untenable, or because I we, was so involved with, you know, Dr. James White's apologetics and everything, the only other option was King James onlyism or uh, King James onlyism pretending to be something else like the confessional text position. Mm-hmm. Right. So that that was where I was, and and I basically couldn't reconcile the two, and so I went to Bart. Right. Yeah. So Eric, what about you? When what what? Did, how did you deal with that? Um, I mean, I was totally ignorant of the controversy for the longest time. Like, didn't really give much thought to it. I mean, I had like like, you know, family members and stuff like that who aren't believers who would bring up, you know, like, well, you don't have the, the originals, you know, like, you don't know what has been passed down and corrupted throughout time. And my argument was always just like, no, like, we have a bunch of Greek manuscripts. <laughs> right. And 6,000. Yeah, we have 6,000 Greek manuscripts and they all agree. And it's like, well, that's not true. <laughs> you know, like we have, you know, 6,000 roughly manuscripts, but there's a lot of really serious discrepancies. Well, like we've been talking about, I mean, this is all known stuff, but you know, how I reconciled the fact that, that God preserved his word and that the, the, you know, the ESV was the the preserved word of God was just, like I said, just kind of an irrational leap of faith. I just said, evidence shows that we haven't figured out what the preserved word of God is yet, which is like that statement in and of itself is like, it has to be figured out for us to know that it's preserved, you know? Right. So, so I I just kind of, shrugged and did devotions with my ESV the next day. Right. That was, that was pretty much how I reconciled it. That was and, basically me. Yeah, and, mm-hmm. and when I, and when I was confronted with like the conversation, like when Dane would attack me with his, uh, <laughs> with his internal dialogue on, that he, <laughs> this, his externalized internal dialogue, <laughs> um, he, you know, I, I would just kind of, you try to be locked in a cave with Bart for like I a year. Would never want to be. Right. Um, Actually, that's pretty fun. But, but he, he was like a pretty jovial guy. Like, yeah, it's pretty right. he, I mean, yeah, like there, there was a lot about Bart that I thought was really cool. And like, I've always been. Link you know, in description for the one we did on Bart. <laughs> <laughs> I think we um, probably. Smash that like button. <laughs> Click here. Subscribe. There will not be a floating box. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. Um, <laughs> and Scott um, quit. <laughs> our, our millennial quits. Yeah, so. we don't know how to do it. Well, um, like, so so, well, we, so quickly before we go on to the next topic, just briefly, uh, starting with Eric, when you were holding to a critical text position, what did you think of the, of the of like the KJV onlyists or those that held to the confessional text position? So like when I first became a Christian, um, I I went around this Calvary Church, this Calvary Chapel Church for a while, and everyone there, yeah. um, including uh, one of my friends that I went with, uh, were all very staunchly. King James. They weren't King James only necessarily, but they were just very like the King James is the best. Like why do anything different? Why change it? Right. And I thought they were just like weird sort of unnecessarily dogmatic, you know, kind of weirdos. And, um, hmm. obviously the cavalry, you know, cavalry chapel has, has kind of its problems, but like right. there, you know, it, it, that was the first time I was ever encountered with this idea that like, there's this preferred translation. Um, and I, and I thought it was weird. I, I, I kind of just put it away with, with like fundamentalism almost, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, you know, going from there, you know, you always hear about King James only and like, you know, we, we sort of just like flick King James only out of our, out of our consciousness because they're just not worth the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I went back to my, my, you know, the best of, of my modern translations, you know, the NASB and the ESV for the most mm. part. And, uh, 
you know, figured that that's just, that was just the best way to, to determine, you know, scripture. And that was the best one we had available was the hmm. NASB or the, or the ESV. I prefer the ESV because it's easier to read, <laughs> you know? So what about, what about you? What about you, Dane? what do you think of the, uh, confessional text people? To be honest, I was jealous of them. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I was even kind of jealous about the King James only is only is because, mm-hmm. Uh, I lumped them together anyway, but I was I was jealous of their blind acceptance and their anti intellectualism, uh, as I as I thought. Now I know that's not actually being either of those things, but yeah. um, I was just jealous that you could have certainty yeah, when I yeah. had when I had I, none. I would say that I had to. I was I was well aware of the irrational leap of right. faith I had to make, and I got tired of doing that. So right. I went to Bard, and yeah. then I went back to just doing the irrational leap of faith. I realized that wasn't tenable. I was just no. gonna end up a an atheistic preacher. Right. Um, like, like remember that article we read? Anyway. Um, there's a big movement of <laughs> atheist pastors. I, I was going to say that, I was going to say that too, like one of the, one of the, the, once I started to actually learn about the, the issue, it just, to me, seemed like on both sides, both camps just like preferred, a, they wanted a place to land. Right. And so they just kind of picked the one that seemed most intellectually honest. So for or me, atheist. it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like, it was like out of a, out of a desire, you know, not to hold things in tension. Um, you know, they just, they just chose to land on one side or the other. Yeah. 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 And that's what I was just jealous of that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then, and then for me, like I said, I was mostly dealing with apologetics, street apologetics, academic mm-hmm. apologetics. Um, I probably wasn't very good at it, but I considered myself to be an apologist. You're right. Uh, <laughs> but, but because of that, like, first of all, I had never met anyone who'd read the KJV. I, I never I don't think the NKJV, for NKJV years, yeah. but like yeah. I just thought that was just another modern translation. Like it, it, before it was, I learned about the modern, like 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 the better and more accurate translations. Like I I was I love the NKJV. Yeah, I like when I moved from NKJV to NASB. Like I didn't like in my mind I didn't really like notice too much of a difference. Right. And um, but but yeah, I had never met a KJV person in the wild. <laughs> uh, I, I I I heard actually. I'm the first person I know that that reads the KJV, <laughs> other than you guys now. Like, like, like when no, like I say that kind of jokingly, but like honestly, like you, if you put if you if you fill Jeff the room, Dewar. You know, uh, oh yeah, that's Dewar. right. Yeah, I, I, but I, oh, I, um, <laughs> remember we used to always make fun of him. We're like, why do you have your King James? He's like, I like it, man, because he was a Cal- he was a Cavalry. Yeah, he was a Cavalry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, that's like right. It, yeah. My, my, I, my I bet, I bet if you, if you if you gathered all the American Christians in a in a giant Wow. Like no, in a giant stadium, <laughs> and you, you just started throwing yeah. rocks at them. You wouldn't hit a KJV only for probably five days. <laughs> Sub- you can't substantiate. No, that. that's <laughs> such a weird like, qual- like quantification. No, but but it's fun. But, like that's my experience with it though. Like like honestly, you you have Calvary, which you know that's probably it because because I was so engaged in a lot of apologetic sort of uh, scenarios. Um, if you're meeting someone that's a KJV onlyist, they're probably Arminians too, and you're probably more likely having a conversation about soteriology than the yeah. text that they prefer. Yeah. yeah. Um, honestly, like, like yeah, that. Like, like I was thinking about that the other day. Like the the Calvary guys, like you know, a lot of them read NKJV now too. I think, but the, um, you know, they read the the KJV only. That they probably have other problems as well. Uh, and then that was my experience with it. Like, I would agree. It, it was, it was never a problem of like translation with these guys. It was like, they were, they were talking about antinomianism or they were talking about really dogmatic about kind of more important things. Yeah. They were, they were really dogmatic about God's sovereignty and they're really dogmatic about their autonomy. And like th- those things seem to be more important than what Bible they were carrying around. Mm. Um, and, and that was kind of my experience. And, 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 and honestly, I just kind of shrugged it off as a logical, let's talk about soteriology. So what was the argument that won you over? To confessional text? Yeah. Uh, you, I mean, you mentioned it a bit earlier, but... What I think watch? initially it was it was the... the you, t- you had told me that... Well, you told me to flip to my ESV, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and then you said, go to Mark 16. And in the ESV 2016, I looked in it. said some of the... I think some of the earliest manuscripts uh, exclude... Or, yeah, exclude this passage. And you said, how many do you think that is? And I said, I don't, I don't know, a bunch. And he said, two. Two excluded. Out of the, over a thousand. Over over a thousand of Mark. And at that point, I like closed my Bible and sat there for a minute. And I was yeah. like, I, I felt honestly lied to. Yeah. Um, because I, I've heard people very boldly with a smile on their face, gladly proclaim that, that they're fine with just ripping a passage out of scripture for two manuscripts. Mm. Um, manuscripts, which I later figured out throughout the history of the church, really weren't valued too highly. No. 
Um, like Vaticanus and Sinaiticus were considered to be, or Vaticanus specifically, was considered to follow Latin readings all throughout the, the history of the church. Um, Turretin talks about it, Erasmus talks about it. And, and that, and, you know, upon finding that out, I went through like the stages of grief, you know, like, um, <laughs> and in, in, in four hours, well, no later, like <laughs> you're, I, I, you're I, ordering an NKJV hours I mean, later. I'm like, as, <laughs> as I'm exploring this, you know, we've only been this position for about four months, like Dane said, yeah. but, um, I, you know, as I started doing a lot of academic reading on it, uh, the, the, the reality of the quality of Vaticanus, um, it made me angry. Like I, I actually got very upset. Um, that that I that that people would sit there from oftentimes a pulpit smiling, you know th this this passage doesn't belong, and and just you know passages like Deuteronomy four two I just think of those and I'm like, with a smile on your face, mm -hmm. with a smile on your face you're 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 ripping the, the canon apart, and uh, so so that that was kind of my process and then and like I said I I, I became really convinced when I discovered what the diamond meant in the NA-28 apparatus. And, and that was very, that was also very revealing to me. Mm. Um, and and that, that was, you know, to the, I just got finished writing my, my book and finishing it, it, like, you know, writing about the ways that Christians have justified removing passages from scripture with smiles on their faces. It, it scares me. Yeah. It, it, it genuinely frightens me. Um, genuinely frightens me. So, Dane, what, what ways has your faith and practice been positively impacted through embracing the confessional text position? You don't care what arguments won me or Eric over? We already, you already, we already went through that one, right? No, no, just you. Just me? Yeah. I thought we were circling back on me because I forgot. <laughs> no. I, I do. I care more about what you guys have to say than what I have to say. So. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm just teasing you. Yeah. Um, no. So, Dane, I, I thought you were talking about uh, Bart and like you... Well, yeah, I was saying that's what... Uh, that's where I was trying to reconcile it. Oh yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. 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 So Sorry. for, yeah, yeah. Yeah. For, uh, <clears throat> what won me over to the text, confessional text position before I won you over to it was, uh, <laughs> was before, you. Yeah, before I was, he there. was the first, he was the early adopter. <laughs> I was the first, it's like the, hipster um, <laughs> the hipster of confessionalism. <laughs> um, that, that was listening to Jeff Riddle. I had been for, for a while mm. and I just, couldn't really answer what he was saying even when I was you know uh holding to uh, you know an irrational leap of faith that I don't understand it but I don't want to be mm. Bart again so <laughs> I'm just gonna read my uh ESV and say oldest and best oldest and best my papyri and uh you know my reason eclecticism will save me from this dilemma um <laughs> from there I went to you know listening to Jeff Riddle and finally I just you know I was listening to him a lot, uh, a lot of Dr. Riddle's podcasts, uh, word magazines and sermons and lectures and everything. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> during the time of us planning Agros, I remember I actually preached a, <laughs> I preached a sermon one Sunday. It was the first Sunday we, we were at our new location. I, and yeah. when I preached from the stage, um, and we, I, I preached on John 17, I think two or 17, 17, either way where it says thy word is truth. Hmm. And I preached from the KGB because I was like, that says that's the coolest way to say it is thy word is truth and your word is true is the other ones. And I'm like, yeah, that's lame. Um, so I just like the way it did. But anyway, I was, I was listening a lot and I was like really hoping to cross over. And I think that might have been, I'd probably tried to have another conversation with somebody at that point. And they just were like, uh-huh. Okay, don't go Bart on us. And then yeah. I like had to stop. But yeah. it was, it was basically. Crying wolf at that point. Yeah, yeah. You're like, stop, dude. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> once, once I, cause I had been told so many times and from so many scholars and, and books and everything that are modern, that if you actually look at the evidence, you, you would have to bury your head in the sand to hold to the TR as the preserved word of God yep. or, or to hold to any of that, or basically be a King James only or ignore evidence. You can't actually meaningfully or honestly engage in the mm. material or have a, you know, rational apologetic that's going to actually engage the society if you hold to this. Yeah. So when I heard Jeff Riddle doing it over and over and over again right. uh, from the from the apparatus of the Nestle Allen 28th, um, I was like, okay, well, well, how do I answer that? I just I, I would have to either go, this man is a fool and is just basically lying just to support his view, hmm. or no, he's actually engaging the material and so right. are they. So somebody's wrong. So I actually look hmm. into it. If I've been told that this view is wrong because they don't engage with the evidence and they can't, and now I'm seeing it happen. It got me questioning and thinking. It, it seems like, and, and I, I 
felt like this after we started we did our study on on the text mm, yeah is like when i started to learn about you know all of these things I, I kind of felt like there was a lot of gaslighting coming from the the modern you know critical text point of view where it's like before they even engage any of the any of the of the you know evidence or any of the um you know material and you know sources and things like that they've already told you that the contrary is absurd you know what yeah. I mean? They've already yeah. they've already put it in your mind that poison the well as uh, yeah yeah poison the well as as scholars they're presenting you with information and before they even present prevent, present you with the information they've already kind of told you that any other silly. view is stupid yeah yeah and so um you know for me I I kind of I, I sort of realized that like when you're when you believe solely in the critical text you know you have this optimism if you're a believer you know you have this hmm. optimism that one day we'll probably find um, you know, the, all the oldest and best manuscripts and they're all going to like, the stars will align and we will, we will have like this perfect, great new, you know, translation, this new collation of Greek texts that are, that are going to be, you know, super awesome. And, um, you know, in the meantime, you know, we just trust God. We trust that his word is preserved and we trust that we can use we have enough. a certain type of methodology that's not necessarily biblical. Right. Um, to figure out what the Bible actually says. Yeah. So in my mind, I'm like, well, okay, it'd be great, you know, if we found a, a you know, a trove in a cave somewhere, like what most people think the Dead Sea Scrolls is. Yeah. Um, it'd be nice if we could find a trove like that, 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 you know, gave us our Bible. But in the meantime, we're living in this, in this, like I said earlier, like in this, in this serious tension where we believe God preserved his word, but we don't really have any evidence for that. Yeah. So hmm. I kind of That's realized cool. that the only way to, actually engage the evidence rationally and believe God preserved his word was coming at it from the presupposition that God did preserve his word mm. and that what the church has used since its you know, conception is <laughs> that, is that word. And, uh, you know, like I was saying, there's the optimism, there's the hope that, you know, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll find awesome pieces of evidence that, that, you know, give us a, a really, really, really good, you know, collation or text or whatever. But conversely to that there's a constant anxiety that you know like what if we do find uh the earliest you know like a lot of you know early 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 copies of a certain text that totally remove something essential mm -hmm. you know what i mean what if mm -hmm. what if the evidence and the methods that we're using show us that you know one of the gospels like like mark you know like is is actually devoid of anything uh resembling the divinity of christ mm -hmm. Yeah. What do we do then? Mm -hmm. Well, right. if, if that's how we do this, if that's how we determine the text and the canon, we really are, are totally uncertain of right. any of the doctrine that we believe in. Mm -hmm. And in order to believe in that doctrine, we have to leap off of rationality and into blind faith. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it, that it's, you know, the TR position is necessarily more valuable because, you know, you don't need faith. You still need faith. You still need faith that God preserved his word mm -hmm. and that he preserved it in what the church has always used. Yeah. You know what I mean? But ultimately, in order to engage the evidence and do actual textual criticism, you have to believe that God preserved his word. And, and you know, here, here essentially it is. Well, and I think that's where the positive aspects uh, and practical aspects come in. Uh, and we can transition into that. I'll start with the question is, what in what ways has our faith and our practice as Christians mm -hmm. been positively impacted by our embracing of the confessional text position. Hmm. I would say for myself, pastorally, um, you know, mounting the sacred desk week after week and preaching yeah. from the pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed like a stupid, silly thing uh, prior that people would look at me and, and think I was being silly, you know, because I was like, there's a 2011 out here at ESV. I'm preaching from the 2016. There's a 2007 over there. I know you have that 2007. Uh, Nick has it. Um, and, and, and so I was, I was very upset and concerned about that, mm. that I was like, these are, we're preaching from the ESV, but there's not even a, which, what is the ESV? Yeah. And so I was always concerned about that and always dealing with that. So I think the first and foremost is I can have a text that, and again, people are welcome to buy a King James or not. A lot of our people have bought uh, King James and Bibles. also sat through our, our Sunday school series on, on the Of text, course, yeah, so yeah. But I'm saying for... Doing for with the brain. Right, right. It, but they're still, yeah. they're still not required to go buy anything. Yeah. But if they want to follow along in... Just like when we're using the SV, I encourage our people to be... You know, have a Bible in their lap, the same one that's being preached from and read from. So either NKJV or KJV will do. And a lot of people have gone and gotten those. 
uh, gotten, you know, either one of those translations, mostly King James, honestly, because that's the one we're preaching and teaching from. Um, so that way they can have the same text in their lap uh, that is being preached from and, and exposited and ex- exegeted. Um, mm. <clears throat> so, so practically in my faith and practice, it's given me a lot more um, peace of mind as a pastor, um, as well as just my own life that I, I have a place kind of like what you just ended on. I actually have a place from which I can uh, do textual criticism. Mm-hmm. I can look at the critical, you know, like Dr. Jeff Rose always saying, we need a critical edition of the TR basically that would have, you know, whether it starts with the Stephanus or, or whatever, uh, or the uh, Scrivener like this, and then has an apparatus with the other readings of the other TRs, that would be great. Um, mm-hmm. But we can now, we can actually only do that meaningfully. You can only even do textual criticism from this perspective is our contention. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. For me, in, in practice, it's giving me peace of mind not only when I'm preaching and preparing uh, right. and ministering, um, but also just in my own private devotions. I'm not constantly like looking at the footnotes, mm. um, and, and and you know, because I always I always love I've always loved footnotes ever since I started reading scholarly stuff. Yeah. And and my TBS Bible here has footnotes, but it's the translators' footnotes that just have variant transla- translations, like various translations. Mm. Otherwise, mm. you could translate or literal translations in the margin. <laughs> instead of, you know, the ESV or NASB or any of those things are constantly looking down and saying, well, we follow the Septuagint here in the Old Testament. We didn't right. follow the Hebrew. The Hebrew reads this, but we didn't follow the Hebrew. That's constantly in your Old Testament. If you go through, say, Septuagint, yeah. Latin Vulgate, Syriac, Arabic, whatever, well, they'll follow that and not the Hebrew. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and then in the New Testament, constantly being like, but our best manuscripts don't have this, or our best manuscripts add this. Some manuscripts have that. But it's like defined best, though. That's part of the problem. Right. <clears throat> it's like they say these are the best, but it's right. like what does, what determines best? Exactly. You know, and that's, right. that's when I started looking into that, too, that's really where I started being like, huh. Right. Best that's, doesn't necessarily mean. No, yeah. What I think it means. And so that's, that's what positively impacted myself. And, um, yeah, I mean that's really it. I think it's probably similar to you. But what do you? What do you think, Taylor? Has been the biggest impact positively on your faith and practice? I, I love besides it. a lot more work. <laughs> you're constantly producing content yeah, for it, people. It, the the well, first of all, I'm I'm looking. And you're in a book. So. I'm looking forward to the day where we don't have to sit through sermons preached on textual variants. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think that that's probably one of the most unfaithful things that's ever happened in this century. Um, that you could you could you could mount the pulpit and preach about how God's word is undecided, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all while saying that God's preserved His word. And uh, I, I think that some of the peace that I've gotten is knowing that when I read my Bible, that it's not going to change in five years. That um, that that there's not an industry behind this particular text, like the modern critical text. Mm-hmm. Um, that no one is profiting off of the Bible's. Uh, constant changing yeah reconstruction <laughs> yeah, yeah. uh and and it it gives me confidence knowing that sermons that i preach now are not going to be irrelevant in a millennium you know like and not that that i care of my words like but the concept right like mm-hmm. sermons should be able to be preached now that are relevant 500 years from now mm-hmm. right uh because the word the word of god is living and active yep. um and uh that gives me great confidence um, it also gives me assurance that my notes that, that I have written on my, in my personal studies, that I can hand those down to my kids and that they can read my thoughts when I'm dead. Um, hopefully, you know, get, maybe know me a little bit more than they, than they did in my life. Uh, just the idea of, of leaving behind a, a theological legacy through to my family, to my children, um, who, you know, I have faith that they'll be believers. And so they'll, they'll benefit, you know, and if you have notes and commentary on your Bible that, that, you know, maybe that scripture is going to be removed. Mm-hmm. Then is, is, wow, that dad, my, my poor fool, to dad. My, my <laughs> foolish father, you know, my foolish father wasted so mm-hmm. much time, you know, spent on John three sixteen, And, you know, everyone knows that that's not scripture. And so, you know, it, it's not about necessarily legacy or, you know, my name being around. Uh, it's more so knowing that the work done by every theologian, every pastor, every lay person, every deacon, uh, every evangelist, right? Like every, all the work being done now is not going to be needed to be chucked away. Like Peter Gurry and Tommy Wasserman say in their book, mm-hmm. right? That commentaries are going to change. That preaching is going to change. Mm-hmm. That theology is going to change. Mm-hmm. And I have peace knowing that God has preserved his word 
And it's not just a matter of blind comfort. Like, you know, it's not, a, it's not like, you, you know, those shoes that people wear with the springs in the heels, you know, like they're not very cool, but everyone, but they wear them knowing that they're comfortable. Mm. You know, that's not why I hold it. That's this. the TR position. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nike shocks. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> shape ups. We're the shape ups of the critical or of the textual <laughs> critical industry. Oh. Yeah, right. And and I, I think that when it comes down to it, for me, I can read the word of God, being confident that God ha- is is speaking to me. Um, because you look at the the language of Article Ten of the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy. It, all it says is that we can have a great amount of accuracy when we read our Bible, mm. right? We, we can we can determine the text to a great degree of accuracy. <laughs> and, uh, okay, where? Like, is what I'm reading greatly accurate? Mm. You know, wh- wh- how, do you, how do you make that distinction? And so I, I was really discouraged knowing that that's the case. That's the majority of Christians, right? Like, well, how like, do you answer the, the common thing that's said against us? I guess that very point. Hmm. Um, that we've traded truth for certainty. I mean, why can't you have both? You know, it's like, uh, here, let me, let me, let me put you guys through this exercise then. What if, what if truth and, and what if what is touted as the most consistent method was based upon um, one manuscript initially that had been considered corrupted throughout the history of the church um, that, that basically agrees in with no other manuscripts, more than 70%, and that's, that's high, uh, agrees with basically none of the thousands of manuscripts. So you go from saying we have 5,000 or 6,000 manuscripts to saying maybe you have about 17, mm. right? How, 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 uh, how certain would you be about your Bible if it was based on about 17 manuscripts? Um, and, and to me, that doesn't seem like a faithful position. Mm. Uh, if you're gonna, if you're gonna both say we have thousands of manuscripts and that the, the Nestle Alon UBS platform is earliest and best, you've got to stop saying you got thousands of manuscripts because you don't, Right. Yeah. you're not using them. Right. Um, exactly. and, and so in, in terms of truth and certainty, I, 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 I think that it's, first of all, it's a false dichotomy. Yeah. Right. First of all, it's a false dichotomy. Second Cause if, of all, if your certainty is telling me that the truth is that we have no idea what the Bible even says. I reject right. that, right. and I'm certain that that's not true. Yeah. So you can just turn on its head. Right. Then we'll or that we, we don't yeah. know what the Bible actually says, but we're certain that God preserved his word. But yeah, it's like, a false dichotomy. You, right. Well, and that's, um, Eric mentioned that, that it's like they, you know, it's like a, the poison well and the, the, the fruit from the poison tree and that kind of thing, where uh, they basically go in front of the battle, and they, they dig a bunch of ditches and put spikes in the ditches. And so before you've even gotten to the battlefield, you're falling into the, the ditches and falling on spikes. So you can't even get to the argument, right? Because it's so poisoned, mm. right? Like you're a traditionalist, you're a fundamentalist, right. you, you're, you're, you're just trading truth for comfort. Um, Erasmus was a Roman Catholic humanist um you know whatever he, he was a black lives matter supporter or whatever <laughs> like like who cares what the argument is anymore just make yeah, something I mean, you know, who cares you're not trying to engage with the with the with the discussion that, that's the thing it's like all right like hold on like let's just you know if for anything else you know let's 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 just be kind to the people that are trying to deal with this stuff because right we're trying to you know figure it out too and like i think we've, yeah. we've landed in a place that we're we're, we're confident of, of right. what it is we profess but you know that's one of my biggest issues with like engaging with this stuff online and like seeing it seeing it go down online it's just like you know you ask questions you know as say you're coming from a place where you're doubting the critical text position you're not even fully sold out on confessional text but you're doubting right. the critical text position you start asking questions and you basically get treated like a rube you know yeah. what I mean? and it's just like you, you're you're like this you know plebeian or something it's just like well just because i'm you know questioning the best and brightest of, of textual criticisms elite it's like little well, like can we talk about it you know and yeah. on the other yeah. hand too it's like you know you get a lot of people that are really frustrated a lot of people from the tr position are really really frustrated from by constantly being snubbed and they're starting to respond in kind and mm. and it's like yeah we need we really need to just step back for a second and like reframe this i think and and right. remember that this is a family discussion and that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're working through it. It's like, I forget, it was Bonson or Van Til, maybe both, probably both, that, that said, you know, like, when you're doing apologetics, you know, I think the same thing applies here. When you're doing apologetics, you know, you're, you're walking down a road with a friend. 
Yeah. It was, you know. Yeah, Van Tell said something along the lines of that. And I think you're absolutely right. And and, and sort of, you know, we were on a tangent. Obviously, we're on a tangent. I apologize. Uh, But what Eric is hitting, I think, is is that the discussion is is being peppered with artillery, you know. Mm -hmm. And you you can't stand in a single place and have a conversation with someone. Um, A a great example is just some of the interactions we've had online recently. And uh, uh, really, you know, when en- anyone kind of confronts you, this is the way it goes. You say, you know, you, you, they find out that you're a TR guy or you read the KJV or something. And they, you know, it, the first thing out of their mouth um, is, is the first five things they've heard on the dividing line, you know, and uh, you don't, you know, not, not to, to rag on, on Dr. White, but um, that's the reality of it. They're taking those arguments and they're taking them into the marketplace and they spit them out. And then when you, when you move them aside and say, okay, um, you know, yeah. that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. Can we talk? They just disappear. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they don't have anything. And, but that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. And that needs to happen. The, 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 the kind of shrubbery needs to be trimmed shrubbery. And, and we need, we need to meet in the middle and actually have a, a decent conversation. Well, yeah, we, we even had, we even had some people dropping comments on our, our most popular video now that we yeah. have, um, I guess podcast number Sick. eight. Um, one where we talked about this whole thing. Um, yeah. And, you know, we had people dropping by and, and leaving comments and mm. we, we appreciate interaction, but they weren't dropping by to interact. No. Um, basically it was the same kind of thing that we've heard a, a billion times where it's, uh, you know, well, that's right. just not true. This is, none of these facts are real. The, right. This is not factually accurate. This yeah. is a uh, complete, you know, just jargon. It's like, show me. And then we go, okay, yeah, show me. And nothing. Silence. And the, well, and that's been pretty common. Uh, on, our, on our YouTube channel, uh, there was one particular individual that, that literally came through and commented on a few of our uh, interactions with a few other people and were like, these guys are lying or they're, they're, they're wrong. Or, and so we were just kind of like, yeah, if we're wrong, please correct us. Tell, tell us where we're wrong. Yeah. Nothing. And, and, and we just kind of had to gently tell him, you know, these are your opinions. Yeah. Um, that, that's not, that's not how this works. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, great for, you have an opinion we yeah, have an opinion just, for first john Cheers. 4 1 talks about testing the spirits yeah. that doesn't mean that that you just are allowed to go into a debate with a christian brother make an assertion and then peace out right like that that is not what faithful dialogue looks like it just right. it just frustrates the process of like having this discussion you know? right. it's like like come on like why no like why why pepper it with so much like difficulty when we could just talk about the the issue, you know. Well, I think that brings us into our last point, which we can then circle back and do the second to last point. My daughter's not having a good time right now. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry if you guys hear that. It's fine. Um, Sparta, having kids. I don't know. Yeah, right. Yeah. Sorry. The family um, in agreement. Come yeah, in. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's the family in agreement podcast. <laughs> family in agreement podcast. We have kids playing, climbing and stuff. Yeah, I wouldn't have um, a problem with that. It might be distracting. Okay, no, last no. topic. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll go to this last part because that exactly yeah, addresses it. Yeah. And, yeah, and then we'll go back and finish up the... the uh, practical part yeah um <clears throat> so the, the question is this is exactly what we were just talking about how should confessional text advocates or you know if you're not confessional if you're if you're just oh, of course even majority you know, text guys you know right if you if you just hold to the tr positions in some form because a lot of guys are like i'm not confessional i'm not re- i'm not even reformed but i hold right. the tr and you're like okay cool right um how, how do you then engage or fellowship with critical text brothers and sisters in the faith? And I think a lot of people would say, and I think it's due to a lot of the frustration that we're getting, you know, we get snubbed, we get called these stupid things and, and, and just mm. ad hominems thrown at us. Yeah. And so we're, we're, we're retorting in kind. We're giving the exact yeah. same thing back at the critical text advocates. Yeah. And, and that's, that's not going to get us anywhere as we know that they're not getting anywhere by talking to us that way. It's the same way. Right. We're just right. frustrating the dialogue. So I think some ways that we could do that is by um, being ironic. And we've said that word. Yeah. You guys had to look up that word. I, I did. Was, I was kind of stoked that I knew that word and you guys didn't. <laughs> I had so no idea. I, what very I thought you misspelled ironic. No, it's ironic. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I learned something new every day. Well, I mean, I think the obvious Who solution... was the first, last one to look it up? I, I didn't look it up. You told me what it meant. So you just, I'm your authority? I probably looked at it Usually, up again like, okay. later. Well, no, the obvious solution here, if you want to have a, a faithful discussion um, in terms of text and translation, you just need to buy an ESV, and then the whole problem <laughs> right. is just, resol- <laughs> just resolved. You'll never hear about it again. Yeah. Um, no, but being ironic, yeah, what does that mean? You were the last one to look it up. Uh, <laughs> it's like a vocab. It basically, it's just like, it's like you know, geez, you're going to do this to me. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's so that they don't look dumb. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, we forgot. We always um, look <laughs> dumb. What is the? <laughs> uh, it's it's basically just you know in, engaging in a way that is that is like I said, it's like making it into a family discussion where mm. you're, you're you're disagreeing on something important to both sides, but mm. you're doing it in such a way that's like you're trying to give this person the best information about your position and helping them make their argument right? and yeah. vice versa. Like you want to help each other make each other's arguments. Cause even if 99% of what you say is worthless, you know, there's going to be 1% that, that, you know, you can learn from, from each other. So we well, need, I, yeah, I think, I, I think a practical yeah. way that it looks like is yeah. okay to put, to put it in, into to real terms. If I'm talking to another Christian, mm -hmm. whether it be reformed Baptist, a Presbyterian or whatever, mm -hmm. the goal is, and if you know their Christian brother is to have, an ironic discussion. Right. I mean, you yeah. respect each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. You love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, yeah. but you can disagree and, yeah. and, and share information. You're yeah. not ironic when mm. you're, you shouldn't be ironic. You're practicing uh, your when, when, you, when you're going towards, uh, say you're engaging with a Mormon or a Unitarian or one is Pentecostal yeah. or a Muslim or an atheist, that those are not ironic discussions. You're on the, the you're trying to prove and demonstrate, uh, and not, not right. Dismantle, not just agree with them and agree to disagree and things mm -hmm. like that. The goal right. isn't to maintain unity. It's to, it's to win them to your position. Right. 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 And then, um, I know I might have to go and help my wife in a second, but, uh, the, the, I, I really think that this is a, this is an idea that's been lost in, um, modernity where you have an argument with a brother or sister in Christ and you help shape their argument right, and say right. like, this argument's not going to, not going to really hold a lot of water for you. Um, it was like when I was debating a lot of guys on pedo baptism, uh, I just straight up told them, I'm like, this household argument thing is not going to work for you. Right. right, right. Uh, you you got to come up with something better. Yeah. I had the same discussion on reform pub. Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you, you're using, you're using the bargain bin arguments, you know, and, and if you want to genuinely go in and compete or, or have a sturdy position, you've got to fortify that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, I was, I was uh, being a little polemic with a 1689 Federalist. And uh, I just told him, I was like, rip my arguments apart, but do it in a constructive way. And I came back and I edited my, my, my thesis and I sent it back to him. And he was like, yeah, this is, much, this is much better. Um, and, and, and uh, you know, it didn't, it obviously was a little more nuanced than that, but, but the, the point is we were, we were, we were working towards mm. a common goal of arriving at truth. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And if the, if a genuine concern and, and interest is to arrive at truth in this discussion, then you, then I'm telling you guys gently, very gently, but also sternly, you have to stop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you have to stop with the unnecessary barbs as, as Eric said. Mm. Yeah. Um, you, you cannot be sharp. Cannot you you cannot be trying to cut your brother or, and sister in Christ, right. uh, mm -hmm. and, and if that's the way that you're handling this discussion, you need to repent mm -hmm. publicly. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you genuinely do. If you if you are losing your temper, if you are calling people heretics and unbelievers, mm -hmm. uh, you need to repent. Yeah. Um, you know, especially if, if these are men of faith who who are are much more wise than you, have much less hair than you. Not me; I'm young and don't mm -hmm. have hair. But the um, in age, right? The gray, the grayness in the beard, right? Like, treat your elders with respect for one, mm -hmm. and and treat them with the the honor that they have earned on this on this earth in Christ. Uh, right. And and I've just seen a lot of that not happening on both sides um, yeah. at, at all. Right. Uh, you know, so, so file down the barbs guys. Yeah. yeah and, and if your confessional text, don't use the same argumentation. Don't do ad hominems. Yeah. I was mostly addressing the confessional text guys. There, right. Right. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. So I, I was going to say too, it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and don't use these things as an opportunity to like, to like take things personally or, or you know, I've seen a couple of things where yeah. uh, one thing that always bothers me with, with Christians is when Christians like take every chance they can to, to like justify themselves or, 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 you know, sort of like, show how they've been wronged. You mm. know what I mean? It's like quietly accept wrong, I think is like, you know, not in every situation, but like, I think for the most part, a good rule is just to kind of quietly accept when someone slights you, when someone says something against you and just respond to it in love, respond to it in, you know, kindness and charity. Um, that's going to go a really long way, especially online where none of us can see each other face to face. And we're just like, you know, tapping away. Um, you know, don't take it as an opportunity to, to practice your witticisms and, and, and mm. just, you know, go into it humble and, and just trying to understand the other position. I, I, I will say I've had a couple bad engagements on, on like the reform pub, for instance. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the, for the most part, I would say 70% or more, 
um, the discussions that I've had and the people that I've interacted with who are firmly critical text yeah. have been, have been ironic, you know, mm. where they're like, right. Nope, this is what I believe. What yeah. do you mean by this? How did, how can that work? You know what I mean? Like we're, we're kind of helping each other along, helping each other, mm. you know, with our, with our you know individual arguments, the, the really bad examples have been pretty few and far between. So, yeah. And it has not been my experience. Honestly, yeah. like, like yeah, maybe, no, maybe because I'm, I'm not in the, in the pub anymore, but the, the, yeah, most, I mean, I guess my, my experience is kind of limited to a specific audience, but, yeah. but I, I'm glad that you've had that experience. Like that makes yeah. me There's, hopeful. there's been, there's been uh, definitely been a lot of situations where I'm mean, not mm. to toot my own, not to toot my own horn, right. but there's been a lot of situations where, you know, I've, I've deliberately done like taking the advice I've just given. And, the, and that's just when somebody says something, you know, stupid, you just, yeah, you just ignore it yep. and, yeah. and deescalate these, these arguments rather than mm, right. them, you know, mm. so. I imagine that your, your, uh, career as a, as an ER tech is really helpful <laughs> in terms of, <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I don't know who's, uh, you know, more, more scary, you know, like combative drug addict, you know, adult patients or combative fellow believers online. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the the reformers well, always hairy. like to call it the lion's den. The lion's <laughs> den. Yeah. Um, that, that gives me hope. I think that, yeah, that, that think a discussion might actually happen at some right. point, you know, an honest one. Mm -hmm. um, Do we have time to give a couple of practical things or should we wrap it up? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think my, my wife is telling me that my daughter is belligerent. Um, if you guys, so if you guys don't mind the screaming and whatever, we'll keep going. Uh, well, they're not going to be able to tell us, so they're just going to have to. Yeah, would you guys like us to keep going? Leave us a comment. <laughs> leave a, we'll check this it This is not live stream. <laughs> leave, a, leave a comment. There's going to be no box up here. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah. So, what's the final question, Dane? I mean, I think the final, final question, question is okay. If you're, cause, because this is a growing movement and it's it's alarming to certain individuals mm -hmm. on the other side, um, but it is a growing movement of confessional text position or TR advocacy, etc. If you are a critic or a, a confessional text advocate, traditional text advocate text or septus advocate, ecclesiastical text advocate, canonical text advocate, whatever you want to call yourself. There's all yeah. these different names. We should find, we need to find a unifying name. Confessional, um, text. confessional text. Confessional I like confessional text, confessional text, but not all of them are confessional is the thing. Well, they should uh, be. Well, then, they okay. should be. Okay, sure. so I think it's more get important that we get them confessional and then we can there talk we about go. Yeah, we go. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. If, you, if you are somebody who holds to this view and you are in a uh, church where none of the elders and pretty much none of the other people hold this view, what do you do? Yeah, I actually had a conversation. I'm not going to drop his name, but he he. I get probably two to five people reaching out to me every week now, um, which is which is just crazy to me and very humbling. Um, but I had an hour conference with this uh, gentleman in California uh, yesterday, and he's like, "Hey, I'm the only confessional text guy in my church. Um, Dr. White's coming to my church in a few weeks, or so, you know, uh, not at his church, but in the area, and there's a big conference, and so he's just like, I." my church is going to be there and I don't know what to do. I'm feeling really awkward and uncomfortable. And like, I, he's talking on the TR and like, you know, there's all these things. And, um, it, it, he was like, he was genuinely like, I'm afraid of like, what is going to happen there, you know? Mm -hmm. And he's like, I, I, I want to talk to my elders, but I'm afraid because I love my church. I, I love the people at my church. And he's just like, I don't want to cause a problem, you know? And, um, and, and so I was just kind of hearing him out mostly and, and, and I think that, that, you know, I don't think I really gave any advice, but, I, but I think to speak to that, I mostly just listened and was yeah. just kind of like, you know, like, Hey man, I'm praying for you. And, um, you know, don't, don't cause a church split, you know, apparently it's KJV only as they're doing those things these days. <laughs> um, but I think if I was going to give advice to the person that, that is the only confessional text person in their church, which is likely to start happening, mm -hmm. um, I think first of all, you need to have a relationship with your elders. Mm. Uh, if the first thing yeah. that you're, if the, yeah, if the yeah. first time you're talking to your elders is because you brought a KJV to church, uh, you, you probably are approaching the whole thing backwards. Mm. Um, you, you need to be going to lunch with your elders. You need, you need to be, you need them to, they need to be going to your house and laying hands on you and praying for you, right? Like the, mm. the you know, these sorts of things need to be happening in your church. Uh, don't just, don't just kick open the pastoral, the vestry door <laughs> and, with a KJV and throw it on the ground and, and, you know, be like, we are having a conversation, sir. You know, like, they're like, who are you? And you're like, I've been on your roster for six months. Yeah. yeah right. Like I've been lifting, I've been moving chairs for three weeks. You don't know who I am. 
Um, so that, be that plugged be, in. Be a member. Yeah, be a member of a church. Uh, be a member of a church. Don't leave your church over this kind of thing. Unless if this is the only thing to leave over, right. this is right. not worth leaving. No. Right. Unless unless the elders of your church are, are you know demonstrate hostility, remove you from a leadership role, yeah. that kind of thing. Because um, clearly that that's oh, yeah, that's yeah. probably problems there. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let the other guys talk in it <laughs> shortly. <laughs> But I would say my, my one piece of advice, uh, be plugged into a church, know the elders of your church, be friends with them. Uh, and if you're at a church that, you're, that your elders are inaccessible, that's probably a better reason to find another church than the translation you read. Right. Um, so have a relationship with your elders and the first conversation you have with them shouldn't be about text. No, I would, I would 100% agree with that. Yeah. And if you are met with hostility by either your elders, deacons, uh, other church members over this issue and you're not the one seeking the hostility, but you're, you know, maybe after some time when you know it's uh, the right thing to do, bringing this up, asking questions and you're met with hostility or they just notice that you uh, are posting this kind of stuff online Mm -hmm. or whatever it is, somehow hostility comes your way from other people. Uh, Number one, it should be not in response to your hostility. It should be in response to, um, you know, you just presenting the view ironically as we said right um if you're met with that i would say i would say ask that person to coffee whether they're the pastors the deacons whoever they are uh, ask them to coffee to discuss you know the primary source material go okay you know i hey i I understand where you're coming from i even held to that maybe um talk about your own let's 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 get together and talk as brothers and sisters and and let's actually look at the evidence let me tell you why i'm now in this position not just because i i saw a cool debate online and now i'm like yeah now i'm this um yeah you know, make it personal, the relationship with the other members of your church or brothers and sisters in Christ and, and your pastors and everything, ha- have a real discussion. Mm-hmm. Obviously if they're, if they're resi- resisting that and they're pushing back at you and it just seems like you're not getting anywhere that those are times to actually have discussions. But, um, a verse that, that goes really good with this is in Romans, uh, chapter 12, verse 18. Uh, he says, if it be possible as much as lieth in you, Live peaceably with all men. Mm-hmm. So as much as it is, is up to us, as much as we can put into it, right, right, right. put in everything you can to at all means possible, be peaceable with those around you. Yeah. Uh, that's non-believers and believers, but especially believers. Uh, yeah. be, be peaceful and, and seek unity. Um, so if, if the unity has to be broken, you have to leave the church, let it be because of other reasons that you're terms. saying or on their terms. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, you, you were about to say something uh, about approaching it from more of a this is why i'm yeah why i'm confessing yeah. text what, what do you mean by that well i mean you know from my from my side of things like i don't have a whole lot of like emotional or like you know identitarian investment mm. in the tr position because i became tr uh, uh, you know of the tr persuasion you know literally like a couple months ago right so yeah. like i mean i can't it would, to me it would just be ridiculous if i went in somewhere and i was just like I am a TR advocate, and if you if you're a critical text, like you know, yeah. you you must not believe God preserved His Word, and also you're an idiot, and also <laughs> you're not confessional, and you're not reformed, which is like the the end all be all reformed guy Trump cards. Like yeah. you're not reformed. You're not mm, confessional. I love, I love that one. Yeah, personally. <laughs> keep that um, one for a rainy day, just in case. You... I like to tell myself that in the morning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I uh, when I harass myself yeah. in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like you know, you, you got to come at it with like the a sense that like you still have a lot to learn you know what i mean mm-hmm. and i would yeah. say practically speaking like the the advice they gave 100 percent yes and to add to that know the argument like know mm-hmm. what you're talking yeah. about don't get stuck yeah. in an echo chamber yep yeah you know what i mean like I, I i don't get it you know when i have these discussions online and stuff like that a lot of times i'm i'm framing the discussion in terms of like me asking questions because mm-hmm. i don't know Right, you know, and it's okay not to know. Exactly. Admit when you don't know, say, "Hey, yeah. I don't know about that exact question you just asked me." Well, that's a good point. Let yeah, me let me that. let me look into it. Yeah, and then go actually look into it. Yeah, right? <laughs> and don't just like you know withdraw and then go back to your echo chamber and yeah. become convinced again. Like, yeah, this is not about you know you know making yourself into a tr guy. This is about just where you know what is the word of God and, and right. how can we know what He said. And that that's a really powerful point, I think, and like it's humbling to me because like we. I generally tend to throw myself into controversy, uh, whether in, <laughs> whether intentionally or not. Um, but th- this is one of those things that I, I saw an, a, a need for someone to be loud for a second, mm. and I was. And 
uh, clearly not very loud, you know, it's like the person standing with like a cup, you know, not a, and the other guy's got a megaphone, but, uh, there, there's an opportunity here for everyone to really stand up and defend passages like the longer ending of Mark and, and defend the pericope adultery. Um, there's an opportunity right now for young guys, especially to be, you know, be a generation defined by faithfulness. Mm. Uh, and not saying the critical tech position is not faithful, but um, in terms of, of returning to the old paths and in terms mm. uh, of, of returning to what is most consistent, honestly, uh, I, I, th- I see this generation starting to ask questions. Right. And, what, and, and you know, whether, whether or not that's because we have a, ma- a massive amount of access to, the, to information mm. or, or whatever it may be, but, but there is an opportunity right now to step in, but it is important to get around to the point. Um, <laughs> it, it is important to remember that most people that I've, I've at least encountered with this, I mean, maybe four years is like, is, is the, the, the most seasoned individual other than like pastor Jeff Riddle and maybe true love. But, yeah. um, you know, most of the people I'm interacting with were recent converts to this sort of thing. Yeah. And, and so I wouldn't, I mean, I call myself a TR guy, but I'm still learning. And, uh, as soon as I get information that I can rely upon, I just send it out and I'm like, Hey, here's information, like be informed. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, all, all that to say is that an immense amount of humility needs to be worn, um, in terms of where you're standing and, and, and how deep you're in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. Yeah. So Danny, any final thoughts before we close out? Um, not really. I mean, uh, it's a good twenty minute yeah, podcast. Yeah, it was a good twenty minute podcast. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, we were gonna aim for short today, but I mean, I just wanted to thank Eric for coming on. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, I don't know if this is fun. Yeah, it was yeah. good. Um, you know, I hope this is helpful. We're gonna get back into uh, two weeks from now. The next episode of the series will be back, where we'll be talking about translations. We'll be starting with the authorized version. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean. I hope this is helpful that uh, just to hear us kind of banter back and forth and talk yeah. about our own experiences um, as mo- as helpful as the scholarly stuff can be. Sometimes this is the most helpful to so just hear people talk on, you know, a, a wider level. Right. Um, yeah. Like a, a more I'm relatable. Layman, you know, right. Like, yeah. I don't. Right. Exactly. So yeah. right, that's it, man. That's it. That's awesome. Uh, and just w- one final comment from me. If you guys like this kind of format, let us know. Uh, I, I like the more conversational format where we're not trying to be overly like brainy about anything. It's just talking. Uh, so if you guys prefer this format to maybe some of our earlier podcasts, let us know and we'll do more like right. this. Uh, well, that has been we'll it. Do both. Yeah, 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 we'll do both. Yeah, that, that'll be great. Uh, that has been we'll it. We'll for... find a table large enough for all three of us too. <laughs> <laughs> it was cute. We'll maybe p- I push you exposed. Every week we'll move you a little further over. She'll <laughs> <laughs> we'll be like, in hey, the corner. Um, oh yeah, someone also uh, wanted to do a library tour, so maybe we'll do that. Uh, I will never reveal what is in here. <laughs> Why? No, I'm just kidding. It's just a cardboard cutout. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's a couple uh, books. Yeah, no, we can do that. That'd be cool. Yeah, so we we're, we we are hearing the feedback, and we're going to be doing a lot of fun stuff going forward. Um, thank you guys for tuning in. This has been Agros Church Podcast. I'm Associate Pastor Taylor Soto, Lead Pastor Dan Johansson, and I'm that one deacon, <laughs> Eric, Eric Dutton. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.